Uptown's more or less um, a state of mind, and um, it has nothing to do with financial status. It all has to do with how free you are inside and how good you feel about yourself and how strongly you feel about yourself and, um, and what you stand for and your beliefs. After the Prince tour ended in February 1980, Prince went on the road again as support act for funk star Rick James on a 42 date tour across America which started only a few days after the Prince tour ended and ran through till May. Promoters billed the shows as Battle of the Funk asking if Prince, the young contender, could challenge the established star Rick James. The press caught on to the rivalry and often compared the two artists and there was certainly no love loss between them, and as the tour went on, Prince's set started to outdo James's show on a regular basis, gaining a lot of attention in the reviews. Roselle Clark from the Atlanta Daily World said about the concert at the Omni in Atlanta, Who would win the battle, Rick James or Prince? I cast my vote for Prince, and judging by the reactions of a capacity crowd, many other people agreed with my assumptions. After the tour ended, Gail Chapman left the band. At the time, it was said to be because of her religious beliefs were not compatible with Prince's sexually explicit lyrics and daring stage show of all the kissing and simulation on stage. She later went on to deny this as the reason for her departure. In the summer of 1980, Lisa Coleman replaced Gail Chapman on keyboards. Lisa was the daughter of Los Angeles studio percussionist Gary Coleman, and although with no professional experience, she had studied classical piano from a very early age. She had been working as a shipping clerk when a friend who worked for Prince's management team heard that Prince was looking for a new keyboard player. And after some persuasion on both ends, she sent a tape and was summoned to Minneapolis to audition. Lisa says about the audition, He wanted to meet me to see if I was nice, so he flew me to Minneapolis and took me downstairs to his studio and told me to start playing. I was kind of nervous since I knew he could hear me upstairs, but he came down, picked up a guitar, and we started to jam. A week later, I was living in Minneapolis. During the summer of 1980, Prince recorded tracks for his next album, Dirty Mind. Again, pretty much a one-man band effort by Prince, who recorded the tracks on his makeshift 16-track studio in the basement of his Minneapolis home. On the 10th of September, Uptown is released as a single in advance of the new album, but it failed to make the pop chart, but it did reach number 5 on the black chart. On the 8th of October 1980, Prince's third album, Dirty Mind, was released. This was the moment when Prince showed the world he wasn't going to be your typical everyday artist. You put on this album, Dirty Mind, and you're just blown away. It's the funkiest rawest grooving record that has ever come out of this town that will ever come out of this town. Dirty Mind, which had, I mean, just broke down all the doors, the sexually explicit lyrics, the look, the sound of the thing, and then the uh, multi-racial, multi-gender multi appeal. I mean, it's a, it was a record that just crossed all the taboos and, and uh, rewrote the map for where people should go musically. Dirty Mind is so far away from his first two albums, musically and thematically, it's almost from a different universe. A stripped-down, funk-ridden collection of demo tape tracks that was a massive risk to release by Prince, given this was the final album of his initial three-album deal. Not only was the music stark, bare and stripped to the funky bones, the lyrics and subject matter on some tracks were truly shocking. Prince deals with incest on Sister, with lines like... My sister never made love to anyone else but me. She's the reason for my sexuality. She told me where it's supposed to go. A blow job doesn't mean blow. Incest is everything it's said to be. Elsewhere, we have the incredible funk of Head, a song about fellatio, with Prince singing. Head, 
Matt Fink plays an incredible synth solo on the track, as well as playing synths and sharing a co-writing credit on the album's title track, Dirty Mind, which is Prince claiming, doesn't matter where we are, doesn't matter who's around, doesn't really matter, I just want to lay you down. Amongst all this raw funk and sex is one of the catchiest pop songs Prince ever wrote in When You Were Mine, which later went on to be covered by Cindy Lauper. But probably the star of the album is the dance funk anthem Uptown a great track where Prince sings of his philosophies about liberation and personal freedom. Uptown, it's where I want to be. Uptown, you can set your mind free. The album closes with Prince's first real political song, Party Up, which was born out of a groove Morris Day came up with. Prince offered Morris $10,000 or a record deal to use it, and Morris chose the deal. The album was lauded by the press, getting four and a half stars out of a possible five in Rolling Stone magazine. It was such a drastic departure from the first two albums, and with its lyrical content, it wasn't radio friendly either, and with sales only half of the previous album. It didn't reach gold status in the US of 500,000 copies until after the success of Purple Rain. But none of that mattered. Prince had come of age artistically and had just laid a marker establishing himself as a highly original artist. In the autumn winter of 1980, Prince puts together The Time, an R&B funk band that would become almost as legendary as Prince himself. The group was put together by Prince for Morris Day after getting him that deal for the use of Party Up. Most of its members came from Flight Time, a band which had been around since 1974. Prince took Terry Lewis on bass, Monty Moir and Jimmy Jam Harris on keyboards. Alexandra O'Neill had been brought in as a lead singer, but after being unhappy about money and the fact that Flight Time drummer Jellybean Johnson had now been left with no band to play him, now most of its members were in the time, decided to leave the group. But he needn't have worried, as his departure left the time, now needing a new lead singer. Step forward Morris Day, who had been on the drums and he switched to frontman, left the drummer seat vacant, which was filled by, guess who? Jellybean Johnson. The final member drafted into the group was Jesse Johnson on guitar. Jesse had moved to the Twin Cities in 1980 and had auditioned for the band Enterprise, which Morris Day was playing with at the time. According to Jesse, Morris totally flipped out when he saw me play. He called up Prince and said, you've got to see this cat. Morris introduced Jesse to Prince, and he was drafted in on guitar. Although Prince had hired some amazing musicians for the group, when it came to recording their first album, it soon became apparent that this was another Prince one-man band project, at least in the studio. 4th of December 1980, and Prince begins the Dirty Mind Tour, 31 dates across America, beginning in Buffalo and ending in April 1981 in New Orleans. Opening for Prince on the tour was Tina Marie, which featured Jill Jones as one of the backing singers. With the exception of Lisa Coleman, it was the same band lineup from the previous tour, with Matt Fink on keyboards, Bobby Z on drums, Andre Simone on bass and Des Dickerson on guitar. The setlist consisted of the whole Dirty Mind album, as well as its outtake, Gotta Stop Messing About. Also featured were a few songs from the previous album, including Bambi, I Want to Be Your Lover, Sexy Dancer and Still Waiting. The shows were very well received in the music press, with positive reviews in both Billboard and Rolling Stone magazines. During the tour, Prince played a date at Sam's Club in Minneapolis, which would later become the renowned First Avenue. John Bream from the Minneapolis Star had witnessed the development from Prince's earlier shows and wrote, He has trimmed the excesses that marred his show last year and his debut in 1979. Gone was the ferocious feedback-dominated heavy metal that brought the comparisons to Jimi Hendrix. Above all, what makes Prince such a captivating performer 
is his stage manner. He knew when to dance with his hand in his coat pocket, when to show a little leg, when to strip down to his briefs and when to strut his stuff. And his soulful strut would make Mick Jagger jealous. After the tour ended, Prince made his first trip to Europe and played his first ever European concert on the 29th of May 1981 at Amsterdam's Paradiso Club. Prince also played his first ever London concert at the Lyceum on the 2nd of June before finishing the short trip with his first ever Paris concert on the 3rd of June. Although, after the band's equipment got delayed in London, Prince didn't take to the stage until 2.30am, three hours overdue. After returning to the States, Prince began writing for his next album. But before that, on the 29th of July 1981, came the release of the Times debut album, and the controversy period was about to begin. <laughs> 